So then, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to telling you about some of the, the human aspects of fuzzing. Um, as was just said, I'm a professor at the University of Bonn, the Fraunhofer FKE, with a special interest in the usability of IT security and privacy software. And that means the human aspects. So my talk will actually be kind of in, in two parts. The first one will be a a very short introduction into my area of research, namely usable security and privacy, um, to set the background for the actual user study where we will then see and contrast the usability problems of modern fuzzing compared to static analysis. So usable security and privacy, uh, Sergey actually mentioned that's where uh, the founders kind of got their education. Um, so there's a, a really interesting area of research. And to put it in a nutshell, the goal of usable security research is to make security easy. And it should be something that people want to use instead of something people are forced to use. And this has been around for a good uh, 20 years now. But most of the focus in this domain has been on the end users. One very typical example is uh, passwords. We all know that end users have huge problems with password usage. But if you kind of look under the uh, water, um, you will see that there are a lot of other actors who actually uh, have even more trouble. So administrators are responsible for setting um, password policies. And here's one lovely example from American Express, um, which says that uh, the passwords won't be case sensitive. There's no need to reduce the password space like that, but it's a, it's a human mistake. It's something which happens because people not, don't necessarily know how to use the technology properly. Going even a level deeper, we have developers who make mistakes in password security. So if you look at the huge password database hacks where the passwords were stored insecurely, that's basically a, a human error. Um, but all of this, all of these problems pale in comparison to looking for bugs in software. Because with this password example, it is fairly obvious to everybody that passwords are security relevant. And then you should be doing something to store them or use them securely, make sure that users use them securely, and to store them securely if you are a developer. So you know that security action is required. However, if you're looking for bugs in software, it really is looking for the proverbial um, needle in the haystack. And there are many places where it is non, not intuitive for the human developer to know that this is now something which is relevant to security. And that's the way that a lot of bugs get introduced into software and can remain there for decades without being found. And one common call um, to solve this problem is to educate people better. We already say, well, we, we spend years educating our developers. Can't we just all teach them all to program securely? And to that I say, it's very unlikely because um, developers are fantastic people. They have a goal in mind and they will reach this functional goal, but security will not always be at the top of, their of the agenda. And that's also why we need to have tool support to make sure that they don't need to think about these things. And kind of our slogan is developers are not the enemy. So while we are always or almost always dealing with mistakes made by humans, I want to really underline that we don't blame the developers here. We don't blame the end users either we need to make technology adapt to the humans and not the other way around. And for that, usable security and privacy research gets people into the lab, sits them down in front of the computer and gives them programming tasks and gives them security tools and we look how they use them. Well, actually before Corona started, we got people into the lab. Nowadays, of course, we do everything online. And that brings us to the actual topic. Um, we did a, a user study comparing modern fuzzing uh, tools to kind of what we considered was the gold standard of security testing, and that is static analysis. That's what we saw the most uh, in industry and academia being kind of used to make software secure, whereas fuzzing is kind of the up and coming tool. We wanted to see what are the differences in usability. And uh, for that, we had actually um, planned to do uh, a really large study comparing all the big platforms. So we, we looked at the industry leaders. Um, in, in static analysis, we found Coverity, Fortify, Checkmarks, um, and a host of others. Um, in the uh, world of fuzzing, it's all open source products. There we had American Fuzzy Lop, uh, Hong Fuzz, and LibFuzzer as the, as, a, as the biggest representatives 
in that area. And we wanted to do um, a large study with a lot of students who could have potentially taken part um, and compare all of these products to one another. However, um, after having uh, gotten academic licenses for all the commercial products, uh, we actually found some clauses hidden in the licenses saying things like, customer will not disclose to any third party any comparison of the results of operation of, we've redacted the product's name, uh, with other products. And that was in the software evaluation license agreement. Uh, another example would be education institutes will not disclose to any third party any comparison of the results operation of, again, redacted uh, with other products, uh, except as expressly permitted by this agreement. And this agreement didn't permit it. And that was the academic end user software license agreement and maintenance agreement. Um, and this is kind of sad. I mean, we did talk to some of the companies, um, but they were not open or interested in having uh, an independent institution look at the usability and effectiveness of their static analysis software. So um, we did consider doing it anyway, but in the end decided to stay on the legal side of things. And we reduced our study down to looking at two different products. So we took the uh, Clang Static Analyzer, uh, which you can find at the URL uh, down to the left. Um, and this is probably one of the, the most popular open source static analyzers baked into the Clang tool chain. Um, and uh, we, we talked to some people who were using it, and they all said this was one of the, the better tools that they'd used. Um, and on the other side, we used Libfuzzer. Um, again, here, we, we didn't just pick it at random. We talked to um, a whole bunch of people who were using fuzzers and kind of try to figure out which was the one they were using the most so we could then pick the most relevant um, product to test. And that then turned out to be libfuzzer. So now we knew what we wanted to compare and what we wanted to look at the usability of. Um, now the question is, how do we set the task? Because of course, static analysis and fuzzing are used for very different kinds of bugs um, and are used in very different ways. So we can't realistically give exactly the same task to both. So we designed tasks for each of those two domains separately. For the static task, um, we just selected a, a bunch of popular open source uh, projects and we ran Clang static analyzer ourselves um, and uh, looked at the number of reports generated. Um, and all these were kind of fairly popular products uh, where we kind of went in with the assumption that most of the reports we saw um, would be false positives. Um, so for those of you who maybe haven't had much contact with static analysis yet, one of the big points of criticism is the number of false positives. So static analyzers run on all of the code um, and find a lot of potential problems, but it's then down to the developer to actually go through that list and make sure that those problems are actually real problems. And of course, the more false positives there are, the harder it is to then actually find the true positives. So for the aim of this project, we wanted to um, uh, differentiate between kind of fundamental usability problems um, of the approach and um, realistic usability problems when uh, used as kind of at, at, a, at a realistic scale. So we picked projects uh, which we thought would give us a nice range to see this. So we picked one simple project, JQ, it's a JSON parser. Um, as you see in the table on the, on the right, that only generate four reports. Um, we also picked Tesseract, an OCR software, um, which uh, uh, produced 476 reports. And as I said, we looked at them as, as best we could, and we, we also thought these are in all likelihood going to be um, false positives. So to give the participants of our study something to find, we added some um, bugs to the software. Um, but of course, uh, uh, to then ensure that people actually use the static analyzer to find these, um, we couldn't just use the most current version from um, the open source repository, because then People could just run a very quick diff uh, and see exactly which lines of code we added, and those would then be the bugs. So we used an older version um, of the software, and we removed the version number to make it a lot harder to kind of figure out uh, which version am I working on to then make a diff or to Google the, um, uh, the bugs. 
So um, let's talk a little bit more about the easy task. So as I said, we, we selected JQ, the JSON parser, which had four false positive reports, and we added one bug to that list, uh, which would be found with use, by using um, the Clang Static Analyzer just as is with the default options. The steps which were needed to do would be to um, uh, use the Static Analyzer or scan build to configure the project, to make the project, um, and then you can actually just view the, the results. And you would then get a report with five items. And you just go through those manually and have to then decide whether that's a true bug or not. Now, for the harder task, um, we select a Tesseract, which um, when, ran, when, when run with the standard options of Clang, um, gives you 476 false positives. Um, if you add some additional options, you can get up to 658 false positives. And in this case, we added two bugs, one which will be found by the default option and another one which would only be found if you um, add the additional options to the static analyzer. Uh, we did that because we wanted to see if um, any of the participants would, without being prompted, actually run additional checks or if they would just use the software as is. Now, the steps needed are exactly the same as in the easy case. Um, the only difference, and it is a big difference, is that instead of having to look at five items in the report, there were either 477 or up to 660, depending on how you configured your analyzer. And that, of course, is a completely different usability challenge. Now, for the fuzzing tasks, that was a lot more difficult. So how do we get an overview of the different difficulty levels of fuzzing um, projects? So. Unlike in the static analysis case, where we just pick a bunch of uh, projects and look at how many reports generated and kind of configure the difficulty level based on the number of false positives you would have to kind of wade through, no similar metric existed for fuzzing to the best of our knowledge. Um, and that's actually, I think, one of the first problems with fuzzing. It is a lot harder to kind of get metrics and compare. I mean, I know that kind of Code coverage is a, a metric which is um, used a lot. So you could kind of look at how much code coverage does uh, a project give you when running fairly standard fast targets. But but there's just there's so many screws here which you can adjust. So um, that we kind of found it very difficult to decide on what would be a fair, easy, and a fair hard task. So what we then actually did is we went ahead and we interviewed uh, fuzzing and pen testing experts um, at Fraunhofer FKE and Code Intelligence. And we asked the analysts who were using fuzzing every day, kind of, can you give us examples of open source projects you found really easy uh, to, to use fuzzing on and ones which were more challenging? Um, and actually, Zirko, who uh, you'll be hearing later on, um, had oops, uh, two projects which worked really, oh, wait a minute, something's happening with my slides, and I'm not quite sure why. What's going on? Sorry about that. My slides have developed a life of their own. So let's hope it stays here. OK, yeah, sorry about that. So as I said, Zirko um, gave us um, some ideas of uh, what projects he found easy and hard. And from that, we uh, picked YAML CPP, um, a, a, again, a parser, um, a YAML uh, parser, um, and Suricata, a network intrusion detection software, as the easy and hard project. Um, and in this case, the, the easy fuzzing task, YAML CPP, it's a small program. The, uh, the, the, it has a small and fairly obvious interface uh, where you have the entry points. Um, instrumentation and sanitizers are not necessary, so you can just run the fuzzer and the bug is so shallow and so easy that it'll, it'll find. So you don't have to modify the build process in any significant way. The fuzz target you need to write is fairly easy and the bug triggers really quickly, so within seconds. If you if you manage to start the fuzzer on this software, it'll find the bug pretty much right away. So we think that this is really kind of the, the, the best case for fuzzing. It doesn't get much easier than this. Now, to have the other end of the spectrum, we had Suricata. That was a network intrusion detection software. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly large program. It was less clear where the fuzzer needs to actually enter. Um, you do need instrumentation and sanitizers if you want to find the bugs. And in particular, and this is something I'll talk a bit more about later, the build process needs to be modified to achieve those things. And the fuzz target is more complex. 
And the bug also triggers after a longer time. I mean, not massively long, you, you do find it within a couple of hours, but you do need to understand that you need to let, just not start the fuzzer, but start the fuzzer and let it work for a while. So now we have uh, an easy task for static analysis, an easy task for fuzzing, a hard task for static analysis, and a hard task for fuzzing. Next, we need some people to actually try it out. And for that, we approached our students um, in my usable security and privacy lecture. It's a master's course. Um, and of course, all the people enrolling in it have a certain amount of interest uh, in security and privacy. It's a voluntary course, so no one is forced to take it. So everybody who's there has a baseline interest in security. And uh, we, um, uh, it was about a uh, hundred students um, in the course, and we recruited 32 of those based on a self-assessment questionnaire. Because of course, since they're working with um, fuzzers and C, C++ programs, we didn't want any students in, in the course who don't know anything about C or Linux. So we had a self-reported assessment um, uh, questionnaire, and we only picked those who gave themselves high marks in C and in Linux. Uh, the study itself was declared as uh, requiring 20 hours of work, 10 hours for the static analysis tasks, and 10 hours for the fuzzing tasks. And participants were asked to keep a journal of their activities and to file a bug report um, as the end of the study. Um, like I said, each participant did uh, one static analysis task and one fuzzing task. Um, we didn't give them all four simply because that would have uh, made it a 40-hour study and it would have been impossible to get students to invest that kind of time. So we decided to pair them up two by two. So um, half the students got uh, the easy static analysis task and the other half got the easy fuzzing task. Um, uh, sorry, the <laughs> half the students got the easy fuzzing and easy static analysis task and the other half got the hard static analysis task and the hard fuzzing task. So we would have a within subjects comparison that we would see each student cope with what we would hope is a similar level of complexity in each of the two paradigms. Uh, to motivate them to take part, uh, they got an 11% bonus for their exam. Um, so uh, uh, that's something which students respond well to. So we had a, a bunch of fairly motivated students. So um, let's have a look at some of the results. So let's look at static analysis first. So we had 12 students who started the easy static analysis task and 11 who started um, the hard one. Now, the numbers don't uh, add up to 32 um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, not all students who register for uh, an experiment always take part. And we varied the order in which they started um, the study. So half would start with the static task, half would start with the fuzzing task. And there were some students who aborted um, halfway through, and that means they wouldn't then, then start the other one. So normally in, in a real conference, I would now have a show of hands and ask people um, to guess some uh, success stories here. So I have the um, click me chat open. So if there's anybody who would like to take a stab at guessing, um, of the 12 people who started the easy stack analysis task, how many do you think uh, got all the way through and successfully found the, the bug? So maybe just type some numbers in the click me chat. Okay, we're seeing some numbers. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so we're seeing everything from 2 to 12. Oh, minus numbers. No, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't get bugs that wrong. Yeah, lovely. So we're getting a lot of nice uh, nice ideas in the chat. So if you if you can look into that. <laughs> okay, I got a, a extreme numbers here. So um, we have a, a wide range from nothing to, uh, to, to everything. So here are the, the actual results. Um, three students um, aborted the task. They didn't even try to submit something. Nine did submit something. And of those nine, all of them managed. So everybody who submitted something did get it right. And as a reminder, it was only five uh, items in the report. Um, and they found the true positive. Now let's do the, the, the same thing with the hard task. So we have um, 11 students starting that. Let's have another few numbers. How many you think managed to find the bug there? Okay, I'm already seeing the, the numbers are lower than just now, which is understandable. Um, but I am still seeing some people uh, getting fairly high. So kind of, uh, I've seen some 10s and some 11s. Uh, there's a seven. Um, 
I, I love this. So you, you have faith in my students. Um, unfortunately, the software did let them down. So with static task, five are boys, so slightly more than with the easy task. Six submitted, but none of them found the bug. So um, the students were not willing for the, uh, for the study to wade through the hundreds of false positives, and they didn't have any mechanisms by which to um, uh, kind of help them find the true positive in the sea of false positives. So here we see kind of the, so this is what, what I would say is the baseline usability comparison for analyzing what's kind of different and challenging with fuzzing. So here we see um, if the site if, if the task is easy, static analysis is easy. So all the students were using the tool correctly. They were also using the tool correctly in the hard task, but the even though they were using it correctly, the tool didn't help them find the box. So now let's have a look at the fuzzing task. So we had 16 students who started the easy task. And again, let's have some numbers in the chats to see uh, what do you think how many people managed the easy task? So that's where they, they didn't need to change the build process, didn't need instrumentation, sanitizers. The class type was fairly simple, and once it ran within seconds, it would find the bug. Of the 16 students, how many do you think managed? Okay, we are seeing again a wide range, but quite a few high numbers. So I'm seeing lots of 14s and 15s, 16s, 12s, 50. Yeah, so um, quite optimistic here. So this was actually surprising to us. Um, eight aborted, so a lot more than in the static task. Eight submitted, um, but only two actually managed to find the bug. And this was surprising to us because we had picked uh, a fuzzing task, which we and the experts we talked to uh, found quite easy. Um, so this just goes to show how important it is to run these user studies with kind of, I would say, normal developers. I mean, these are student, math students, they will be finishing soon. So these, these are kind of people who will go out into the world and program for companies. Um, and even with this easy task, um, most of them did not manage. And so I won't even bother to ask for numbers in the hard task because of course, if even the easy task was this difficult, not one of them managed to find uh, the bug um, in the hard task. So now we come to the, the actual usability problems. So. With the static analyzer, unsurprisingly, this is, has been well known in industry and academia, um, but we saw exactly the same results. The flood of false positives is just a killer. So all the participants used the tool correctly. There was, there was no misconception on how to use the tool. That was not a problem, but the tool was no help to them once the problem got into a more realistic size. So, I mean, most projects will not just give you five items on the report. You'll get hundreds. And I've talked to industry experts who, who kind of go into companies and run professional static analysis software. They have projects where there are hundreds of thousands of items in a report. And you really need very well-paid specialist people who, who will take the pain to wade through that. So here, we, I really kind of think conceptually, this is a bit of a dead end. So I don't see a, a clear path forward how we can reduce the false positives without also reducing the, the true positives. So more interestingly, what are the usability problems of um, LibFuzzer specifically? The first and kind of most obvious is there is a high skill requirement. So un unlike the static analysis tool, which is basically you just you, you need to run a couple of uh, command line tasks with a fairly clear documentation, for LibFuzz, you needed uh, a lot more skill. It is not so much a tool to use, but more something you program your security solution with. So it really is, it's more of a programming task than a, using a software task. More specifically, um, we looked at where, so of course we had the logbook, so we could actually go in and see where the students were spending time, what they were struggling with, and we also interviewed them in the end to get some more details. And one of the first problems was, that they didn't even really know uh, what to do to get started. It was very hard for them to get an overview of how to, to start the process, how to approach the problem, because it's just this one big monolithic thing which they were kind of sat in front of and said, you have 10 hours to solve this. Then 
once they kind of got past the stage and kind of figured out what they need to do, um, then the next hurdle was selecting the compilation parameters and kind of modifying, adapting the build process so the build process would include the fuzzer. And then the writing of the fuzz target also caused problems for the few students who actually got that far. Um, and for those of you who have used fuzzing, you can see this is pretty much every step of the way. So currently with the, the open source lib fuzzer, um, kind of normal master level students had trouble with every step of the way. And um, the documentation needs serious work. So um, the students, of course, uh, were asked to uh, keep a protocol of what resources they were using and how useful it was. And we saw again and again that the, the documentation they were finding did not uh, come up to the, the level they would have needed to really support them. So unlike with static analysis, in this case, participants didn't even get to use the tool properly. So we can't even really say how useful the outputs are going to be for them because they couldn't even get to that point. Um, and the takeaways are, so I mean, these are the open problems, but the nice thing about these open problems is we have good ideas how we can solve them. So this is not a, a, an inherent problem of dynamic analysis and fuzzing. It very much is a, um, it's something where we know how to get these things done. So we can automate a lot of this. So breaking the task down into different steps is really useful. So we were just doing another study where we did this. We kind of, we told people, um, these are the couple of steps you need to do. Didn't tell them how to do them, just that these are the steps. And that already was a huge benefit to them. And then we can help with, we can automate the, the build process. We can integrate files more automatically and we can help in the writing of FOSS targets with code generation. These are things which, which we can do and we really should do to make fuzzing a tool for the masses. And with that, my time is up. I, I thank you for your interest. And if any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Ah, so there's a question in the chat saying, um, uh, are the fuzzing test targets and the results public available? Not quite yet. The paper is being written um, and it hopefully will be accepted soon and we will then publish everything. So we'll publish all the source code, the entire study protocol um, and all the detailed results. So you can then uh, look at those things in detail. And if you are an academic, you can of course replicate the study. So we support replication wholeheartedly. Um, but that information will be online, hopefully, very soon. Yeah, so then another question in the chat is, did the students find one or the other concept hard to understand? Was static analysis as a task easy or hard? Static analysis was much easier. So the students felt much more comfortable with that because it, re it was just a tool to be used. It wasn't something they had to kind of program around. So we really need to move fuzzing away from being kind of something built by fuzzing experts for fuzzing experts, but something which is a tool to be used. And that will really uh, unlock the potential. So, I mean, currently, if you, if you look at the success, I mean, how many bugs did Google find in Chrome? I think it was kind of 18,000. But of course, Google hired the people who built AFL and LibFuzzer. So um, they really have the most expert of experts working at their company. That's not an option for most places. We can't all kind of hire 10 PhDs or even people who write their own fuzzing software. So it needs to move towards a, a tool to be used. Okay, do you think the result will change if the samples of the students of this experiment increases? Um, well, yes and no. So um, I think the 32 students are fairly, uh, are a good indication of um, how this level of student will cope with it. It'll change dramatically if we can recruit other kinds of people. So we, we did the same study with uh, five people from uh, uh, the Capture the Flag team. So students who, also students, but students who take part in hacking competitions. And they, of course, all browsed through the hard static task. So they all managed that. That was not much of a challenge for them. But of course, these are on the very extreme end of the skill spectrum. We also did the study with some professional developers. And again, this is, this is um, work which is under um, uh, submission at the moment. Um, and the more security expertise someone has, the easier it is to use. But 
for that level, so just for, for students who are interested in security but who have not had a lot of practical experience yet, fuzzing was harder than static analysis. Um, Matthew. Yes. Time, so for the change. So any questions can be asked in the Slack channel. Maybe Matthew will answer himself. Or yes, I will I be know. in the Slack channel after this. Cool. So thank you for your presentation, Matthew. Thank you very much.